Our introduction to the Moscow came through Harley, a guy who'd spent decades researching and exploring Utah's mining history. His knowledge of the people and places that make up Utah's unique mining history is uncanny, and his collection of artifacts and historical documents is unrivaled. On many occasions, we'd visit with Harley, and after a time he began to open up more and more. He began sharing stories of his exploits in the Star District, west of Milford. On one occasion, he told us a story about spending over 36 hours underground gathering photos and artifacts from the mine. Harley was getting a little older and recognized he wasn't going to be able to take on these extreme archaeological challenges much longer. He really began to spur us to go deeper and solve some of his lingering questions specifically about the Moscow mine. A trip was made into the mine through a series of declines, crawls, chutes, and ladders. Three of our fellow explorers, Mike Capps, Stuart Burgess, and Derek Bracken, made it all the way down to the 1100 foot level. This was as far as Harley and his group had ever made it, and our mission, for ourselves and for Harley, was to somehow see all the levels accessible. On our second trip, we decided to take our mine winch and erect it above the Cullen shaft a connecting shaft to the Moscow workings whose depth and extent of levels was still unclear. We erected the winch beam above the ant trap-like collar, made some repairs, and set a few sturdy levels some 50 feet down in the cribbing. I took the task of propelling to the first level, 300 feet below the collar. This level, known as a 600-foot level, is actually only about 350 feet below the collar but it's called the 600 because all the levels of the mine are based on the original workings, higher in elevation and on the other side of the mountain. The 600 looked promising initially as I got off rope and stepped onto the dusty level an ore car frame sat at the end of the station with an old rusted drum affixed to the top. I began searching the drifts for clues and artifacts. This level proved to be relatively small and had little to offer in terms of artifacts and exploration potential. The next day I rappelled to the 900 foot level, some 650 feet below the collar. After rappelling for what seemed like forever, my lights illuminated the station of the 900. I think Maya's probably going to take that jug. I'm hoping that this bounced in. The 900 level had a substantial stash of dynamite boxes, and I gathered one for every person on the surface, stashing them near the shaft.
I followed the main drift with the ventilation ducting for a great distance with no drifting or stoping to the sides to speak of before I came to a massive collapse. We don't know if there was a winds or perhaps an ore bin at that spot, but whatever it was had completely fallen in and blocked the passage. Well, that's what we call a collapse. No getting through that. Discouraged, I returned to the station, binding the dynamite boxes together, and then I signaled for the winch and took the long, slow ride back to the surface. By this time, the mine had grown in our minds to something of a nemesis. We were told of vast levels of untouched history, but had so far found only a few dusty relics and collapsed passages. Our third, and to this date most ambitious trip, was designed to reach whatever levels lie below the 1100. This time we didn't take the winch. We worked our way meticulously from the surface near the old Moscow shaft, deep down into the heart of the complex, and over to the Cullen shaft the shaft we had previously repelled. All the while we drug our 600 feet of rope, vertical gear, and what we hoped would be enough water and high calorie bars to get us down and back up again. Stuart, his wife Crystal, Maya, and Troy made the long journey, Jules Verne style, to the 1100 foot level. We established our rappel from that level and sent Stuart down. 300 feet below the 1100, Stuart faintly yelled off rope, and we watched his flickering ember of light extinguish as he headed down the drip. Soon he returned and called myself and Crystal down. The 1400 was an interesting level, and held a large dewatering pump that we had read about in some of Harley's documentation. We explored for over an hour before returning to the shaft to examine our options. Taking a look at the mine level signs still affixed to the station wall, we quickly established that the Cullen shaft descended only to the 1600 foot level. While this revelation was a bit of a disappointment, because speculation and references from historical documents had alluded to the final depths anywhere from 1800 to 2300 feet. Finally, Stewart, the bullheaded guy he is, decided he was going to descend to the bottom, be it a massive collapse, water, or the dusty bottom of the mine. Stuart carefully descended and reached the bottom some 200 feet below our level. After rejoining me on the 1400, he said that the cribbing had fallen away from the last 50 feet and piled in the sump at the bottom of the shaft. He crawled down the roof of the station before he could stand upright and examine the level. His trip was relatively quick, and is a good thing because I was getting pretty nervous. I presume that he may try to get back to the 1400 foot level via a raise we had read about in Harley's documents and we had earlier discovered in our exploration. So I sent Crystal up the rope back to the 1100 and waited for Stuart to reappear. Stuart soon returned, trudging down the drift from the raise. He was glistening and sweaty and filthy and we sat in the darkness as he recalled a few of the details about the bottom level and his ascent up the rays. We had hoped, and certainly Harley had hoped, that the bottom level would be full of artifacts, chiefly some 20 ore cars that were referenced having been purchased and delivered to the mine sometime in the 30s. The lowest level would have been the last level to be worked, so logically this would be a sound assumption, but it turned out not to be true. Stewart only saw one small utility car on the level. We rested for a moment before we gathered our most prized items from the 1400 foot level. A unique box Crystal had already taken up with her, along with some of the most pristine dynamite boxes we had ever seen, and of course the bell signal sign, a three foot tall enameled sheet metal sign adorned with all the various bell signals and regulations of the mine. These would be the only things to accompany us on the arduous trip back out to the surface.
We pause for a moment in the fading sunlight to take a few pictures. While some may feel that the Moscow got the best of us this time, we'll be back soon and in greater numbers.